Okay, so made it here. I'm here today with Chad Hansen at Philosopher's Corner, and we're going to follow up this discussion on incomplete nature. And I guess I would just turn it over quickly to Chad. I know you had some things you wanted to say, and I, I also wanted to pick up a little bit of the review that this book had received in the New York Review of Books. So, yeah, sounds, and so what were some of the things that you wanted to say about the book? Okay, first of all, I do want to say I just watched the, your video, and I think you laid out the, the basic theme and, and uh, the basic ideas of the text uh, fairly well. Um, and so maybe we can talk about the more philosophical issues, because I, the way I see it, this text is a, a thoroughly philosophical analysis of the material or the physical world, in a sense. And what I mean is uh, he, he employs uh, logical and, uh, in a sense, mathematical ideas, formal ideas, to talk about, I mean, the way, even the way he discusses how, for instance, how autogens uh, come into existence. He says, we don't know the exact specifics of the material aspect of it, but the logic has to be something like this. That's right. that's a philo I mean, the philosophers, as far as I can see, Pythagoras and Parmenides, these are the guys who introduced that logical approach as opposed to Thales and Anaximandrus and Anaximenes, the first three scientists, really, who were right. into the material world. Right. And so Deacon, I think, is taking a thoroughly uh, philosophical approach here in terms of the logic. And one of the key ideas, I think, is the notion of geometry. Now, okay. You mentioned geometry with respect to the uh, morphodynamic processes, right? And certainly, uh, geometric shapes come into existence. But part, I think, of what I'm saying, as a matter of fact, if we back up to the thermodynamic level, uh, I think you can get an understanding of it because, uh, you know, you can make a, uh, uh, a two-dimensional grid to represent uh, the position and the momentum of the uh, particles, and that is what uh, Deacon, in, in general, is called a phase space. Right. Well, that phase space has a geometry to it. It's a space. Space and geometry, in a sense, interchangeable concepts. And oh, so right. he, when he talks about the geometry of the morphological or the morphodynamic processes, in part what he's talking about is that geometry of that phase space. So, for instance, when you add the constant energy to the thermodynamic level so it can't settle down, Right. Uh, basically, you're limi limiting some of the uh, possibilities in that phase space. You're constraining it from settling down to symmetry. Right. Right. So right. that if you look at the geometry of the phase space, it implies what is possible for this system. Right. Right. Now, I, yeah. Well, I mean, no, I, I think that's that's really right on, and I think this is partly why it is a critique of nominalism, and it's also why when he says, I mean, maybe this is the thing to launch into is. One of the real insightful notions here, and it is, it's very philosophical, but to claim that the whole is less than the sum of its parts. This is a, a really, this is a sly move, right? To, to try yes. to talk about what has to be constrained out of the system, we'll call it by way of an attractor, which identifies the general characteristics and thereby the particulars that can be excluded and it's those things that are excluded or need to be constrained out, which I guess they they take advantage of the geometric possibilities in yes. those constraints. Yes, and as a matter of fact, to, for me then, part of what we want to mean by information is being able to read the possibilities implied by the constraints. Yeah. Right, so right. It, it's not so much that, that uh, uh, for instance, when you read a sentence, it, you look at the words and you, you, know, you see those shapes and you get the meaning. But in a sense, of course, as soon as you got the sentence, everything else is excluded, right? But it's also the shapes of the letters that are excluding certain things, you know? And so basically even just reading the sentence, in a sense, is uh, being aware of the, what is constrained. Right, right. Well, let's, let's see if we can't, I mean, so, some people are going, what the hell are you guys talking about? This is very abstract. So I'll just give a real one, you know, Let's talk about some things that he doesn't talk about in the book that maybe show that we're trying to follow out and, and maybe socially apply or shake out what this means. I was thinking of just the example of a dog leash. Okay, so I have a leash for the dog, and I have a retractable one that can vary in its length. Now, the length of a line could be a geometric property, and it gives a set of constraints, and so you don't notice, I mean, you don't really want to call it simply efficient material causality. 
There is, there's a different set of causality that comes in with the leash in the sense of the space parameters that the dog is free to rove and it's what has been excluded allows for the, you know, the, the longevity of the dog. I mean, the reason I have the leash isn't just to have the dog on the leash. It's, it's not, I mean, now I guess if you have the, the leash very tight and you're walking the dog like in the dog show right next to you, it seems like a material and efficient cause. But it's really a probability field for delimiting the constraints of possible interaction. Really, exactly. And, and that's, I mean, uh, that's kind of, kind of the new thing that, that Deacon is introducing here. You know, the, uh, the, the idea that what is, you know, as you said before, is being, and even in your video, what's, what is being eliminated or excluded, you right. know, is creating uh, the, a particular structure. I mean, you know, that's sort of the morphological or morphodynamic right. morpho form, right? I mean, right. And, and yeah, and that's, that's a point in, uh, in, in your argument or, or your uh, uh, realization that he's critiquing nominalism here. Oh, right? yeah. It's, because, it's throughout, you know, it's throughout yes, the text. Yes. Yeah. And the fact that we can now speak of forms as, in a sense, uh, uh, causal, right? In the, se in the sense that the forms are determined by the constraints and the constraints in showing what is possible, what is not, will cause certain types of behavior. Exactly, exactly. The generals cause particulars to the extent that we can see the form of the attractor. I mean, it's just sort of the way that we construct moral orders in society is through admonishments of thou shalt not and don'ts, but... If people have accepted a whole series of don'ts, if an alien observer would come and look at them, they would never see what the people aren't doing. You can only observe what the people are doing. And so the, the sense in which, again, and I think part of the, the, I think one of the really interesting features that he's doing is the difference between those kinds of constraints which dissipate themselves and are unable to perpetuate or recursively continue their own existence or to, to propagate further constraints as opposed to those yeah, and that's, that can. that's part of the reason why it's important to uh, it, it have some uh, ability to, for instance, at the thermodynamic dam, dynamic level, to feed energy into the system, right? right. Because otherwise, otherwise the, uh, the constraints will dissipate. Okay, okay, no, okay, no, I, I agree with that, but... It's, it, there is a sense in which you always have to have an inflowing of, I guess, of energy. And this is why all of us are really more like rivers that have, you know, we're, we're coagulated rivers that have certain forms out of it. I mean, we're several million, hundred million year old forms of spaghetti with a thin sheath of, of skin on it. But it's, I, I don't know how to say that. I, I think it has to do with the inbuilding of historicity which changes causality into information. That not all causality is informational in the way that all information does have causality at its core. That is, it is a causal process, but information includes a historical record of the constraints and possibly the, the continued perpetuation and the, the sustaining of those kinds of constraints. Yeah, and that's what I was trying to get at when I was mentioning uh, Rudolf Arnheim. Is it Rudolf um, uh, yeah, Rudolf Arnheim, uh, in his, his idea that, uh, you know, the, the art and visual perception, he says, what we see when we look at something is the forces that are implicit in the forms. And part of that is because the forms contain the history of what went in to create them. Right. And so we can see the, the forces implied by the history of the forms. Right. Right. So, you know, yeah, it's, it, it, it basically it's, it's a, he's talking about a way of reading information, right, in terms of uh, not necessarily what's right there in front of your face. Right, right. But, and, it, you know, we, we've had so many discussions in the past over this issue of index icon symbol, right? And we've both, you know, we've talked about it at length in other videos and it is interesting. I, you know, we've talked about it, I guess, off camera before, but it's on, I think, page 442 where he's talking about autogenic interpretation and he says, now this is unrelated to what he's talking about, but he, he's concerned whether autogenic theory can help decide if iconicity or indexicality is more primary. And it's interesting because if you look at his symbolic species, he's clearly moving out of a Persian paradigm where he does place a primacy on uh, iconicity 
And I think he, he thinks that's adequate. Now, I, I don't want to say that this book is simply without trying to tackle the Persians, revise the Persian categories, and put a primacy to indexicality, saying that indexicality is basically the properties of thermodynamic iconicity is basically the properties of morphodynamic. And then by the time you get to teleodynamic, you have all those properties we associate with symbolicity. I mean, they they really do nicely align with the Persian categories. And I I wonder to what extent, I mean, didn't you register that in when you read it? Yes. Yes. In fact, it's clearly, and even when he's talking about, in in a sense, the autogens, right? When they, uh, if if the autogen needs this uh, nutrient rich environment, but of course, it, as it uses up the nutrients, that r- environment becomes less rich. Right? right. So if it can surround itself by a skin that will hold in some of those nutrients and maybe be inward permeable, but not outward permeable, then it can basically keep its own supply of those things. Uh, and that's indexical. Uh, that's the first re- uh, reference, right? It's indexical right. of the environment. Right, exactly. And, and a gradient hard. as a percentage, for example, a glucose gradient is an indexical. It's not, yeah, it's exactly. not, it can't be iconic. As a matter of fact, I even use, I use that notion. Uh, uh, now, what if I make up a scenario. I don't know if it's accurate. I say, but you got amoeba here and a grain of salt. I don't know if amoebas eat grain of salt, but there will be a gradient around that grain of salt. Right. The closer you get to it, the, con- the concentration of salt molecules will be more. Right. And the amoeba can climb up that gradient and then find that ground, you know, and wrap itself around with its, you know, it throws its arms around it and absorbs it. That's indexicality. Right. You know, right. and and so a lot of that, well, yeah. So it seems that that indexicality surely is, uh, uh, although, uh, you know, I, I can see that uh, at least the potential for index uh, indexicality and iconicity because they're natural seem to be uh, almost on a par. Right. Uh, it's what right. you no, use the, first, you know. Right. Right. I mean, I th- well, it goes back to the ancient form matter distinction. Yeah. I mean, it's it's caught in all these things, but it does seem. It seems interesting when we go back to this question of causality and information that that there can be causality without information, but there can't be information without causality, and that it's a second order property of historicity and constraints that are able to perpetuate themselves. But it seems like that extent there is a possibility once you get to information that it it has again, it starts to drift toward possibilities of iconicity which lead toward deception or forms of mimicry that then, whether that's even at the molecular, I guess we're going to call molecular level at viruses or things that are able to to pass at that level, but it seems like there, there do seem to be things that simulate what we're going to call some of those, you know, the beginning properties of life again, where it's, it's perpetuating itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I, but I still think it's, I mean, clearly that, uh, all throughout the book, he seems to be uh, the, right behind the scenes is that notion of indexicality with so much of this, you know? Oh, agree. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it would be interesting to get him to to respond and say, you know, in, in his first book, he's clearly moving out of a Persian scheme where he, he clearly just accepts as a matter of course that iconicity comes prior. And again, there's metaphysical commitments to that. I think, you know, the yes. per, Perse has a kind of metaphysical commitment. Okay, the, the beef that I wanted to have, and this is, I don't know if he would ever see this, but this gentleman, Colin McGinn, who does reviews for New York Review of Books, gives... One of the worst book reviews I think I have ever seen. The, it was just horrible. Not only does he single out Deacon's prose as being abominable, and oh. just he, he, he attacks it. And I grant that it is a very difficult book, but it hinges into the world and has. Uh, it, it's readable to a, an educated person who's willing yes. to give him the, the time. If you're willing to spend the time, and then not only does this person basically misunderstand Deacon and attribute to him the kinds of position that he's trying to distance himself with, which is sort of this bad emergentism that he doesn't want to subscribe to. But Colin McGinn actually opens a paragraph with this. He says, if you are wondering whether Deacon has something in mind like Sartre's use of the concept of nothingness to characterize the essence of consciousness as proposed in being and nothingness, then think again. He shows no awareness of that monumental phenomenological work on pure absence. 
It leaves me just baffled. Uh, this Colin McGinn couldn't tell Sartre from a hole in the ground. Uh, I have spent so many years of my life studying being and nothingness, and I find unbelievable connections. Rich, if, if he's really familiar with being and nothingness, which I think is a much more difficult work than this. I mean, it's a piece of philosophical. It, it's ontology, which includes, you know, it, it just it's, it's, a, it's a much more far ranging and it isn't connected into the physical world but this is this is an obvious case from my perspective this is an obvious case of intellectual jealousy i think there are people who are irritated with how well deacon is put together so much and it has it's probably single-handedly thrown into question in crisis certain people's research. Oh, yeah, this. for sure. No doubt about it. But, of course, to, to, to be intellectually jealous, I think you would actually have to kind of understand the text as well. And I'm not sure. I think he felt intimidated by it, and he was intimidated by it. Unlike Sartre, where you could go, oh, I don't get the philosophy, Deacon's talking about the world, and so you feel inadequate if you can't understand it, because it, it, there maybe is a real an argument about the world itself and its natural yes, the process. the physical world, right? Yeah. Yes, it's the natural yeah. world. The scientists are taken seriously. I mean, admittedly, Sartre was recognized and he was hailed and, and celebrated. But I think Being and Nothingness was a book a lot more talked about than read. Very few people can slug through Being and Nothingness. And it is, um, it has wonderful complementary work. I mean, th there could be a dissertation awaiting the person who would have oh, yeah. the wherewithal who could, you know, combine these two words. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've told you myself, I've got it on my shelf, and I tried reading it, and I just, you know, could not oh. get But I think I'm going to start going back to it now, and, you yeah. know, because of this understanding, a better understanding of what nothingness can actually imply, or different forms of nothingness, you yes. know. Yes, yes, and, and I think abstential, abstential phenomena, not yeah. pure absence. I have no idea what, yeah. again, yeah. that's not a word Sartre would ever use. Sartre would say, yes, that in the same way that, the you know consciousness is a lack that it's perpetually haunting the in itself there's the same way in which the i guess if you try to use deacon's terms it's the structure or the attractor is a real but not made up of the lower level material so it but it's not simply epiphenomenal yeah. That is, it's somehow a recursive doubling back at a different order. You know, it's, it's and that's a, one of the important things. Another one of the important things that he has showed us how these things can be not epiphenomenal. Right. right. Um, and, and, in fact, he delivers a wonderful argument against just the pure epiphenomenalism of some of these things. Yeah. Right. right. Um, one, one of the, before we, you know, I, I know we have to, can't stay on too long, but one of the things I do want to mention here is also the notion of value. Uh, which you, I mean, because in, that one of the most important things in the scientific world is that, you know, I mean, you, David Hume says, uh, the world cares no more for a human being than for an oyster. You know, there's, uh, now I admit, and it, it, at the thermal dynamic level, maybe there's no value, uh, but right. per, certainly once you get to the level of the autogens, um, and they're basically wrapping themselves in that skin to uh, keep those uh, uh, nutrients around them, uh, then there's a certain value at, at, you know, of having those nutrients in a particular way and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. And, and, right. and, and I think, you know, one of the things that is... Can I just can I jump in? So, so value is, the, value refers to the constraints by which non-equilibrium states become furthered. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, to me, as a matter of fact, well, I went to the Semiotic Society of America and I met somebody there who defines value, wanted to define value the way I do. In America, we tend to define it as what we prefer. Well, I like to define it as what can be used. And okay. so the autogen is using that skin and the environment in a particular way that puts a certain uh, value or valence, as I think is the, the word that they, they can use, a valence on uh, that, those particular situations. And so it, it creates value uh, there. Uh, but, you know, and, and in part, you know, it's, it's uh, the... Um, Actually, I think it's, it, I, I want to go back to usefulness. It's the way the constraints can be used to further the constraints. Right, right. Or create right. even more constraints up at the higher levels even. And more right, people. right, right. So, yeah, I guess it, it partly has to do with the particular kind of work that emerges out of intersecting yes. orthograde processes. That's the way so, I see it. Like, and that's like, why, go ahead. 
Well, I, I was going to say, you know, if you think about it as, you know, there are different kinds of of orthograde processes. Like one could be the speech itself, and as the as uh, as the dissipation of sounds as I'm producing them. But then the history of the language is dissipating as well. But those two different kinds of orthograde processes together produce a contragrade kind of work of me speaking the language. Like, I mean, again, I don't, I don't know if that really works, but, it, but it's, I think that there are ways to try to get at, of, of, I mean, how would you describe the way that speech and language, I mean, I guess they are both kinds of orthograde processes that when joined together allow for contragrade process, contra, contragrade work. Yeah, um, and I think it, it be, the contemplative work be, be, begins in the, the head of the person you're speaking to, right? Because they, you, you're basically stimulating their neurons in a particular way. They're, th- they're taking in your information and thinking about it. It's creating those tensions between uh, the, their existing ideas, but also that general tendency to, you know, to daydream, and you know, uh, you're, you're working against that. So I think part of the, the work starts in the head, of course. And then, you know, because uh, of that work that's going in there that allows us to restructure our information, maybe we can see the constraint, you know, or see more constraint that we couldn't see before or right, see more possibility right, right, that right. we bring new things into existence, right, even right. if it's just new sentences or new objects. You know? Right, right. Well, I mean, I think maybe a different way to kind of see I'm sort of all over it. But it, I think part of it is that Deacon is giving a very radical, radical critique to those who want to do a one-to-one correspondence between brain state and consciousness. Yes, yes, He's going, yeah. that is ridiculous. What you're really getting is something like, you're getting, both ther- you're getting both thermodynamic and morphodynamic processes at the neuro- n- neurological level, and the kind of sentience that arguably is even being exercised there isn't even convertible up to the next morphograde dynamic. So, I mean, you could never get from brain state to conscious state. Yeah, Instead, yeah. you're going to have lots of intervening levels all through And, of there. course, what he's showing is it's not the brain states. It's the constraints of the brain states, the way they're constrained, and, you know, the possibilities of, that we can see there. Um, and, uh, you know, as my, there was, a, there was a, a book not too long ago by uh, Roger Penrose, uh, the, the Emperor's New Mind, I think, right. that tried to show that we could actually, our brain can be working at the quantum level. And, I mean, even when I was going through it, I thought, well, you know, why do we, we, we don't really need this. And uh, Deacon shows you why, as a matter of fact, he shows you why it can't be that way, because uh, the way he describes how the quantum effects are kind of filtered out from the higher level of effects that we're sort of oblivious to, right, you know, right. and, and, and our, I think our brain is oblivious to, and it certainly doesn't need to work at the quantum level, according to uh, Deacon's description. I think he it described uh, consciousness beautifully uh, compared to, the, you know, everybody else who's ever made the attempt. And, of course, he does not use that material substrate at all, right, right. right in the right. sense of, of, of giving the possibilities of that. right, right, but at no point, okay, yeah, no, but at no point is he making anything like a recourse to a supernaturalism. I mean, his his emergentism isn't, um, it, it's not like all along waiting something like this. It has to do with certain possibilities that have come from again various kinds of constraint. You know, now I think about this might even limit determinism. You know, I mean, you could have a, a sort of a, a, a thoroughgoing determinism at the at the uh, uh, thermodynamic level. Oh, right. But at, but not up here. I mean, we could be you know totally freed from that determinism in terms of the morphological and the teleological levels. That's you know? right. That's right. But it, yeah, exactly. And it has to do with, I guess, habits, with the learning to get some wisdom about habits, to get some wisdom about classes and types and how certain forms end up perpetuating themselves. I mean, I think there's, I guess there's species of wisdom that one could extrapolate out of the book into sort of like a living philosophy. There's just so many ideas. I mean, he points out that that nature is not bothered by that conflict of types uh, where, you know, because the general determines the the particular, you know, and they're kind of like on the same level there. But that shows that when in logic we feel a need to separate those types, what we're doing, of course, is analysis here, and we're setting up the structure of analysis. Uh, but that that allows us at, in that structure to set it off against the 
the blending of types or, or the ignoring of types in the sense in the, in the natural world as he explains it. Now, I don't think I laid that up very clearly. Right, uh, right, I, right. I, of course, I'm gonna have to go back and read the large sections of the book again. Oh yeah, you yeah, know, so I'm, much there. I'm still, yeah. I'm still hung up on a way to try to shake out because he doesn't really do it like in a direct way. Shake out the way speech and language, and then I guess you could add writing in there. But I guess in some way, again, I'm trying to get at it, that that speech it has phonological constraints, but it's those are relying upon the um, the speech production. I mean, the actual acoustical blasts, which are largely thermodynamic. I mean, they're just thermodynamic yes, flow yes. that I'm inpouring energy that's coming out. And yet, there is an ongoing record of constraints. Now, see, part of this has been really problematized because literacy has so altered consciousness to liberate it from largely morphodynamic constraints in speech production. That is, most speech produced in oral societies was largely based in rhyme, in uh, in oral cliche, and in yes, oral formula. Yes, figures of speech, rich in figures of speech, right? Yes, yes, that, that there was little tolerance for novelty and little tolerance for the kinds of syntactical and grammatical gymnastics that we literates can tolerate. You know, right? I mean, the, 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 uh, there was, um, yeah, the, the, like just try to think of the semi literate in the number of like advertisements, for example, that use rhyme. And will you, that people will think that things that rhyme are true and things that rhyme somehow stick in memory better because there's a natural morphological constraint in rhyming sequence. And it, yeah, it actually even goes further. If you look at the Homeric literature, uh, there's not only those rhymes, but those cliches like the rosy color dawn that right. uh, you know constrains certain you know you, you know, it, but but it allows you to kind of remember you know the part of the poem that you you know that, because there's no it's not written down anywhere, right? Exactly, exactly. And it's so if, if you look at you know speech as acoustical blast, like speech as index, like animal cry, pointing, yes, yes. like, you know, the equivalent of speech as a cry that's indexically context bound, as opposed to increasingly abstract language practices, even in an oral society. And then from the kind of discourse that we now have as literate, it seems like the, there, there is some way in which the externalizing of the constraints and solidifying them as rules or habits liberates up certain kinds of free play and novelty within. So it becomes a probability field within which agency can move. Yeah, yeah. And of course, when you start talking about speech in terms of indexicality, you start sort of analyzing speech semiotically. But then when you're talking about, you know, once we are looking at the meanings, you know, that would be semi semantically where it's, you know, the symbolic comes in. Right. And, and so, uh, and in fact, I, I need to look up, I think it was Greenberg, so one of the linguists, uh, and I can't remember the glottalization or something like that, where this one linguist was saying, all that we're doing is responding to these noises. And our brain is responding, and we're thinking that they have meaning. And of course, once we think they have meaning, they do, right? But we're just responding. It's, but basically, it was to, uh, putting an argument out for a, a, almost a sheer indexicality uh, of speech, which I, you know, I think goes a little bit far. But I, I want to yeah. look at that, uh, that historically. I want to pick that up. Again. Yeah, but it, I, mean, I guess it, it, it is like one way to say it would be that dictionaries have stabilized a set of constraints which allow. As already established contragrade process, they allow for increasing forms of work to be done by those who, I guess, willingly participate in those constraints. So if we both have dictionaries, those, those constraints allow us to, I guess, create new forms of expression moving out of them. Yeah, and that's why I like to use the dictionary as a sort of a standard that I don't think dictionaries give you the correct meaning. They right. give you the most common. Right. And so it's a sort of, you know, it's a common ground that we can all start from. Uh, and it, to me, it does perform that, that role that you were saying there. Well, now, it is, I, it's, it's a strange attractor. I mean, a word is an attractor <laughs> of the historical usages. A word has a form of all of the currents. Like a word like participates in situation and it accrues particulate matter of all those situations that it's participated in. Now, it gets ossified once placed in the dictionary. Yeah. 
even yeah. local local oral uses, I think, have those same sorts of properties. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Vico, uh, 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 John Batista Vico mentions, you know, and he says every word, every metaphor, I think, is every metaphor is a fable, a little miniature fable, right? Uh, feeling its history. Right, you know? right. I mean, yeah, Dorothy, I, Dorothy Lee has wonderful stuff, you know, the anthropologist, where she would say that every word, every symbol, it it's not an abstraction that's over against, but it's a part of situations that slowly takes its meaning and value from the, the kinds of situations in which it's participated, and it accrues its meaning. It never simply has meaning applied to it. The meaning yeah. comes as a sort of, I don't know, an osmosis out of those particular situations. Uh, back in the 60s, we used to call it cosmosis. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, I think you know, that's, that relates to uh, Wittgenstein's uh, insistence that uh, uh, meaning is usage. Right? I mean, right. because and, and part of the reason he insists on that because meaning can't be the ideas in my head because you can't get at them. Right. You know, so you can't possibly know what I mean in that sense, but you can tell how I use a word, you know, right. and of course, that, using it in different ways is exactly what you're talking about, accruing uh, all that, those historical right. baggage. Right. 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 right, right, But I mean, th think about it, you know, speech without contragrade process is basically just, <laughs> just, it's just <laughs> dissipative noise that never achieves anything like a, the work that we call thought. Yeah, and actually, I, I think it's, it's also, in a sense, interesting to look at the physical constraints uh, that are necessary to produce. I mean, you know, uh, right. we don't believe Homo habilis perhaps had language because their uh, hyoid bone is in the same place as the gorillas who can't uh, articulate, you know, but then Homo erectus has it where we have it, you know. And right. so, I mean, Robin Dunbar's grooming gossip in the, or, uh, the evolution of language has wonderful stuff there on the kinds of breathing in the particular chest we have, the larynx, I mean, all, some of the, the, the different physiological yeah, yeah. and anatomical it, requirements. Yeah, and the gorilla, you know, who's leaned over, they, their, their, their rib cage has to support the visceral organs there, right. whereas when you stand upright, it's the pelvis that right. takes that pressure off of here, right? right? It allows us to breathe differently. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess the whole resonance chamber of the throat, all these kinds of things are somewhere between morphodynamic and uh, thermodynamic. I mean, they're thermodynamic, but it's a morphodynamic yeah. structural resonance. Yeah, I mean, yes. we, we have and a, they, a, and they, a tractor that allows us to produce resonant sounds. Yeah, but only within certain constraints, right? Atmospheric pressures, all kinds, yeah. right? You don't, you don't notice that the atmospheric pressure is required for you to produce sounds as you do, but right. Yeah, really. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't make sounds on the moon. No, <laughs> really. And of course, the funniest thing is, you know, without the, the, the spacesuit, because the, the atmospheric pressure is also, you know, pressing on your skin and your skin's pressing out. So when right. there's nothing pressing in, you know, right. Right. <laughs> so just try it. <laughs> right, right. No, that's, that's hot. Well, I know I'm getting a little uh, uh, off topic here, a little frivolous. Yeah, but. well, it's, it's, well, the, the thing is, is that the book is so far ranging. I mean, I do think that to people who are going to take the time to keep their appointment with it, they're going to say, wow, you know, they're, they're really, it's a difficult book, though. I do think, I give that, uh, you know, Colin McGinn, I do think it's a difficult work. Yeah, yeah, it um, is. But I, I think it is consistent. I think he's systematic. Yes. I think he walks through it almost painstakingly, you know. Yes. You, you just gotta almost. <laughs> you got to take notes. You're going to have to sit and look at the diagrams. Yes, and, yes. You know, and, and, I, and I think the real work to be done is what we're poorly or roughly just sketching here off the cuff is how is this shaken out in the social political realm? What does it mean for things like the way we understand money? What does it mean for the things that like, what do we mean by family or what do we mean by education or what do we mean by politics? I mean, these are, have become I guess, forms that have organized our lives and their set of constraints that have perpetuated themselves in organizing societies. And I think, you know, the more that we could see, I guess, and I don't know, maybe he, he would disagree, but I mean, I guess I want to believe that there is some possible agency in certainly not a person changing any of them, but collectively people 
becoming more aware of these properties and collectively trying to govern themselves yeah, I, I, more like, wisely. I, I think he is single-handedly given us justification for ethics because, you know, in ethics we have certain values, right? But, you know, if, if the, the values are just things we make up, then we have simply relativity, you know, rel right. uh, but, but he's, he's put value back into the world. He's and so put we value can, back in the world. Yeah, and so it's there. It has to. I mean, we we use it in ethics, you know. And of course, what is ethics is not the, in a sense, one of the most overarching social processes that that you know. As a matter of fact, in a sense, what creates a society, right? See, it's interesting. He puts value back in the world, but it's not at the thermodynamic level. So yeah. he's put it in the world, but denied the physics access to it. Yeah, and, yeah. And so that's of course and that explains why we can't try to reduce that. To, to the to the physics and get 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 rid of it totally because right. it, it, yeah it's it's dis, it's uh, disconnected from the physical level because of the in a sense because of the morphological level even in between yeah. that yeah, and I the I, mean, I don't know if I yeah, it's, it's not disconnected it's just not it's it, it's embedded and inextricably caught within or yeah. how do I say yeah that? that's what I mean what I mean is that the, the, it's not allowed to interfere in a sense I mean it, it's there for, it's a necessary substrate for the uh, uh, teleodynamic level right uh, but it doesn't interfere with it in, in that right sense. right 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 it's a necessary substrate right yeah right right. And of course, we could go on forever. Right. <laughs> well, Chad, it's always fun talking with you. I, I wish we had more time. Maybe we can entice other people to read the book and try to shoot some responses. Yeah, that would be nice because I, it is an invaluable book. As a matter of fact, I told my wife, I almost feel like it was written to explain everything I've been studying over the last 40 years yeah. uh, because it's so comprehensive and yet so cogent and, you know, and it, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's integrated. It, it's integral. I mean, there's, you know, yeah. he, carries the same theme, in a sense, all the way through. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally feel like it's, you know, I, I'm excited about him giving the AKML, the Alfred Korzybski Memorial Lecture. He's going to be at the Princeton Club in October. Uh, this is in 2013. I'm, I'm really excited. I'm, I was a little bit irritated with the review that he got in the New York Review of Books. It was, it was unjust, to say the least. And I think that's partly why I'm, you know, on a campaign to go, look, people, uh, don't don't believe everything you read. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got you got to get in there and judge for yourself sometimes. That's right. That's right. And this is as, as far as I can judge. This is an amazing text. Yeah. Yeah. Right well, all right, Chad. It's good seeing you. Take care. You too, Corey. Okay. Take care, and I'll talk okay. to you. Bye bye. Bye.